Well, good morning. You can be seated. Looking around, I see many of you who I do not know. What a joy it is to be able to uh, worship with you this morning. And so thankful that you're with us. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at City Church. And um, as Kyle welcomed you, I want to send a word of welcome. And if you are um, a little bit sleepy, I want to tell our church family, uh, especially if you've been around uh, here for a little bit, and um, it's, I know it's, for some it's still early, um, and you haven't had enough coffee, we have a really cool thing that uh, just we started this week in our cafe. Uh, we have our very own For the City blend of coffee. Um, it's our own roast that we have here. It's very good coffee. And so if uh, you enjoy coffee, um, and even if you don't enjoy coffee, you need to try this out. But if you're feeling a little sleepy after uh, worship this morning, go. You can actually purchase these um, bags and they will support the ministry of the church. Uh, we have 12 available right now. We'll have these available every week, but um, enjoy that great coffee. We, we, we want to give the very best. And I, um, a, a friend of mine and I, we, we created this blend. So I can just tell you it's very, very good. All right. And so and I'm a coffee snob. So um, anyway. That's that, but enjoy some good coffee. We are in a study in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew chapter 7, and um, that you heard read for us this morning, and um, continuing in this. If you're a guest, again, we have been working our way through. It's our practice here at City Church to work our way through uh, the text, primarily through books of the Bible, periodically, as we're doing right now, through sections of a particular Bible, and we have been... Uh, just making our way through, nearing, coming near to the end of the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. As you think about life and as we consider all of the things that we engage in in life, I um, can't be helped but, but, but ask the question, and we have to think sometimes, I'd encourage you to think about uh, yourself in this context, and when is the last time, how often in your life do you do, have you engaged in something that was really hard? Something that perhaps even seemed impossible. And when you face those hard things, when those challenges of life come before us, what do we do with those really hard things? How do we respond when we have something hard in our life? My hope is, and one of the beauties of the church, is that as we deal with the hardships and the challenges and sometimes the pain of life, we have one another if you're fortunate when you have to do something hard, you have friends that surround you, that come alongside of you in those things. I don't know if any of you, I'd expect most of us at one point in time in our lives have ever have moved. Perhaps you, you are like me at one point, you had that third floor apartment. And then some of us have been the friends with trucks that always get the call. Some of us sold trucks just because we don't ever want to be the guy that gets called to have to help someone move. But when we face those challenging things, and of course that's a very small in comparison, but those challenging, those hard things in life, it's good that we have help, that we have friends that surround us. And that's one of the blessings that we've said of the church, that we have one another. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, has been teaching us life in the kingdom, how to live in the kingdom, how to pursue the kingdom of God and the desire of our hearts and to ultimately pursue His righteousness, something very, very hard. A challenging thing. If you were with us last week, just remember back to what He told us to do the beginning of chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that you not be judged. That's not an easy thing for us to do right. It's a hard thing to not condemn our neighbors, to not look across the street. He said, rather than condemning your neighbors, look inwardly and deal with your own sin. And once you've dealt with your own sin, taken the log out of your own eye, then you can become a friend to the sinner. After having received grace and mercy and you understand what that experience is, then you can go and become one who gives grace and mercy in the name of Christ to another. But think about it. Which is harder? Is it harder to condemn your neighbor or to deal with your own sin? In my experience, it's a lot easier to condemn and to point the finger and to tell everyone why they are wrong than to look inwardly at the sinfulness of my own heart. We're so quick to do that because it's what's easier. It's easier to look across the street than it is to look inwardly at your heart. And think about what we condemn them for. What, it, what, what is, gets the ire of our hearts? Sin. 
some form of it, whatever we might see, whatever we know might exist there, some sin issue that they haven't dealt with. But consider, just again, this is, I'm describing the hard life that Jesus is calling us to do, the hard things of life that he's calling us. The neighbor that we quickly condemn, rather than looking inwardly at our own sin, perhaps doesn't have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling them, informing them how to live. We who have the Holy Spirit of God, call, Jesus is speaking to Christians here, have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us, giving us that conviction, helping us with our sin, and we will be quick to condemn the one who doesn't have the Holy Spirit before we'll ever deal with it in our own hearts. Is that crazy? But that's the reality because it's hard to look inwardly. It's hard to deal first with ourselves. We'd rather go about thinking it's our responsibility and job to fix everyone rather than looking inwardly. And Jesus, he knows that's the condition of our heart. Jesus, this is one of the beautiful things about Christ. He walked. He was fully man and fully God. He did not have sin, but he empathizes. He understands our condition. He deals with us. And so we become gracious and kind to others when we start looking and loving like Jesus did and living in the way that he did. But again, that is a very hard thing. Jesus called us early in the Sermon on the Mount to pursue righteousness in his kingdom. And at the end of chapter 6, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Again, those are hard things. And so as Jesus calls us all throughout this Sermon on the Mount to, to these challenging things, these things that he knows will be very hard for us in our flesh to do, this is the beautiful thing about Christ. This is a reflection of his kindness to us. That he is gracious, he empathizes, and he comes alongside. And here in verse 7, he says, I'm here to help you. I've called you to do these things, to live in this this way, to be people of peace, to be people who pursue the kingdom, to be people who pursue righteousness. But I know that you need a friend. And Jesus is the friend who sticks closer than a brother that comes alongside after having called us to, to a life, called us to a way of living. He says, I will help you. And how do we receive that help? Jesus says, ask. When you need help, ask, seek, knock down the doors of heaven, asking me to do the things that I've called you to do, to help you in your time of need. That's what Jesus does when he's saying this as he's teaching this text, verses 7 through 11. He's telling us that he's here to help and he's coming alongside us. Now, too often when we read this text, and I assume that perhaps some of us might have even heard it at one point in our lives, somewhat taught this way or revealed to us in this way, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And we begin to read this text through a man-centered lens, through getting what we want. We take other texts, John 14, Jesus says, ask in my name and you will receive. And we take those and we put them all together and we think of Jesus, we begin to think of Jesus kind of like the genie in the bottle. We rub the lamp the right way, we pray the right way, we open our Bibles the right way and Jesus will have to respond to us in such a way that we would do something. But that's a man-centered view versus a God-exalting view of Scripture. Let me just encourage you just as an aside in all of the Bible, as we study the Bible together, as we look at the text If you find ourselves constantly trying to insert ourselves into the story of the Bible, trying to figure out which character relates to us personally, how we can do something because of this story, that's a man-centered view of Scripture. A God-exalting view of Scripture is one where we recognize that this book is given to us so that we might glorify God and we might make much of His name. So rather than trying to find something to answer our puzzling question, let us glory in God together as we read the text. That's what Jesus is saying here. And that's what all of Scripture is saying. Don't look at it through what this gives me, but how does this help me glorify my Father in heaven? And so, he says to ask, seek, and knock. And if we think about that man-centered view, we can find that it really doesn't hold any water for us. It doesn't really sustain us in any sense of the word. What are the things that we need God's help to do? What are the hard things, 
the really challenging things that only we would say, and we often use this language, by His grace alone might we be able to do this. One of those is to see our own sin. To see in our own hearts, to recognize the brokenness of our own hearts, the sinful desires of our flesh, to be aware of those. How many people in the world have no idea how often in our own lives do we walk through life unaware? It's only by God's grace, only through the power of the Spirit will we be able to see that. That's something that we need God's help to do. We need God's help to heal our broken hearts. We need His grace. We need Christ to lay down His life as a sacrifice for the sins of the world, for you and for me. That's what we need Him to do. We need God's grace to be able to forgive when someone has hurt you, when someone has harmed you. Forgiveness doesn't come from the flesh. We don't do that naturally. And we, if, we, if we try, we won't do it very well. And it'll only have a temporal lasting. To truly forgive. To do what God does when He forgives us of our sins. Where He says that his, our sins are as far as the east is from the west. That's the forgiveness of God. When we forgive others, is that how we view those harms, those hurts? Are they forgotten? No, only by God's grace. To be a part of this body. To be faithful in all that the church and living for the kingdom and being involved in the work of the kingdom ministry, only by God's grace do we need those things. Now, if we take all of those, and I didn't even, I could, I could literally just go on until lunchtime, until this evening, if y'all like. There's no Cowboys game on, right? So we're in. I won't, but we could on and on these hard things. And think about where our minds, though, typically go when we hear, ask, seek, and knock. Ask me and I'll give it to you. Usually, they go to very small things. Very temporal things. When I was younger, I really liked that car. I want that car. If I just ask, if I just do the right thing, maybe God will give me that car. Or I want that promotion. I want, to, I want to receive that job. I want to get this thing. Whatever it is, there's so many things in the world that we just fill in the blank that are the desires of our heart sometimes. And that they, we fill in that blank. And those are the things that we're desiring that I, we ask for. But does God have to be involved for those small things? Think about the things that occupy our minds and our hearts so often. And does God have to truly be involved? My kids love the Tesla. So I expect many of you do as well. It's a cool car. Does God have to be involved for you to get that car? No. There's plenty of people that have no relationship with Christ, no knowledge of God, who drive some pretty amazing vehicles last time I checked. Does God have to be involved to achieve that dream that you have? It's possible. I have no idea about the spiritual condition of Elon Musk. But he's the guy that invented the car. And if he has no relationship with God and he invented the car, how small are the things that we can so often think of and the things that we dream of? The guy that invents the car that some of us all dream about, he might not know God and yet he has it all in the world's eyes. Whatever it is that we look for that we dream about so often, there are these small things. I love the way C.S. Lewis put it in his book, The Weight of Glory. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered at us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what it is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. You think about the things that occupy our minds, that captivate our hearts. And as we said a couple weeks ago, those things are not too big. Those things are way too small. They're, they're insignificant, pointless things that will one day all be turned to dust. And Jesus has given us instruction all throughout this sermon to seek the big things, the kingdom of God, His righteousness, who He is, Himself. That is what we are to desire. And those are the hard things to, to truly live 
in constant pursuit of the kingdom of God is a very hard thing. That's not an easy task. To to pursue the righteousness of Christ, that is not something that comes easy to us. And so Jesus says here in this text in verse 7, as I have called you to do these very hard things, to pursue the things of me, to live for me, to allow my light and my life to live through you and to shine brightly through you as you go out into the world, ask and I will help you. Seek me and I will help you. Knock on the door of heaven and I will answer. The door will be opened. These are the things that we should be pursuing. These are the things that we're called and should occupy our minds. But we see the, own, our, our, the sinfulness of our hearts. We see the fickleness of our, our minds. When we read that text, ask, seek, and knock. And immediately, we start to think of these small dreams that we have. Jesus is saying to us, dream bigger. Let this morning's message crush your earthly dreams under the weight of the desire for the kingdom of God. Can you imagine if we lived our lives collectively as brothers and sisters in Christ, constantly in pursuit, aware of, with the desire to see the kingdom of God be built here on earth as it is in heaven, as we were taught to pray? If everything we did, everything we engaged in, we desired to know more of Christ, to see Christ reflected in us more and more and more, imagine what the world would look like if just us lived that way. The disciples, there was only 12 of them. And we still know their names and we know the stories of their lives because they were not chasing after the fickle things of this world. They were chasing after the big thing. They gave their lives in pursuit of the kingdom of God. That's not to say that all of the gifts and the kindness of God that we receive in the various forms that we're supposed to throw that away or to think that we don't just to, to ignore it? No, that's not what Christ is calling us to. But if our dreams, if our minds, if our hearts are anchored and focused on pursuit of that kingdom, the big things of God, we are going to find that we need Christ. We need Him to make those things happen, to see those things happen. And so, Jesus tells us, ask and it will be given to you. This calling to ask that Jesus gives us is simply a general calling to pray. Prayerlessness. Prayerlessness is a, is a, a revealing th- fact, a revealing thing to us because it shows us how little of God we really need. I know I've been with many of you in various circumstances of life where the circumstances hit so close to home and so hard in your life that there's nothing that you can do but get on your knees and cry out to God. And sometimes you can't even cry out to God in words. You have to only cry out, as the scripture says, in groans. And the Holy Spirit has to come alongside us and help us in that. And it's in those hard, very painful seasons of life that we do that. But Jesus' instructions here are that we would groan, that we would desire the big things of God so much that we are constantly seeking Him in prayer. And so the fact that we live our lives very often, and just consider, just let this hit on your own soul. In the last week, how many times did you pray? Very little, more than likely. Our prayer services here at the church, we gather on the second Sunday of every month for prayer. They are a lightly attended gathering because we don't need God, because we have all that we think we need and we don't desire and we don't press in. Desire for the kingdom is so often something that is lost, something that doesn't fill our hearts and minds. Jesus is saying if we are to do the things that he's called us to do, to live as people who love graciously rather than condemning our neighbor, people that pursue the kingdom of God, people that, that, that give and, and serve in the kingdom of God, all of these things, these are the big things of God that he's calling us to. And if we're going to do that, we're going to have to pray. We're going to need his power. We're going to need his strength. We're going to need his endurance. All of these things that he's called us to do. And he says that if we would just ask, that we will receive. Jesus isn't the genie in a bottle. The God-exalting view of this is that we would be asking for the big things of God. This is a continual sentence, ask 
And it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. So often we read this as individual items. So we ask and then when asking doesn't work, then we think of seeking and then, when that, and then there's, there's knocking. And those are three different kind of uh, executions or activities that we engage in. But in the original text, what Jesus is using here is a grammatical sort of way of saying this is a building up. That we are asking and as we are asking, our asking turns into seeking because sometimes we don't know where to turn. Think about your children when they didn't know the answer. They didn't know how to solve a problem. There was something in their way. What do you hear across the house? Mom! I can't find my socks. Dad! The lawnmower won't start. They don't ever mow the lawn. I should have said that. (laughs) When we don't know how or where to turn... The child knows to seek mom or dad for help. And Jesus is saying, in your prayer, in your constant asking, when you get to that place where you're not even sure where to turn, seek me. Seek me out. And guess what we have that is a gift to us that allows us to seek Christ and seek God? We have this book, His Holy Word. Every single thing that God intends for us to know about himself is found in this book. Everything that God wants to reveal to us and to help us with is found in this book. There's other books that are great. I read a lot, but nothing replaces this book. This is the authority of God. This is the inerrant word of God. This is the sufficient word of God. It is all we need. And Jesus says, as you're praying, as you're constantly pleading with me for the kingdom of God, for the big things, the hard things, those things that seem impossible to you in a spiritual sense, keep asking and keep seeking me through this book through what I have revealed to you, what I have told you about myself. And as we seek Christ, we're asking for the big things of God. We're seeking to know Him more. Sometimes we have to knock. Periodically, there are things of God that we don't understand. Sometimes people get angry about that and say that I can't accept a God that I wouldn't be able to understand. I would ask you, why would you worship a God that you can understand? That's not a God that is worthy of my life. The God that is worthy of my life, the God that is worthy of my worship, the God that I worship, the one true God, is the God who I can't understand completely and who is sovereign over all things. And sometimes he tells me as his child, sit down and wait, young man. I will get to that when it's the perfect time, when it's according to my will, I'll open that door. But that says, Jesus is saying, keep knocking, keep desiring. Again, when is the last time in your life that your prayer life and your seeking of Christ and your knocking on the door for the things of his kingdom, you were so passionately engaged in that, that it was as if you were knocking, banging down the doors of heaven, asking God to move. More than likely, many parents in this room isolated to singular, singular events, maybe around your children, maybe some events around something, some hardship in your life. Jesus is calling us that this pursuit of him, this desire for his kingdom, the desire for him to rule and reign in the world, all of that, and for him to work through us, that should be a constant prayer of the people of God. But we knock on the door and we wait until in his perfect timing, That door is opened. Now Jesus gives us an illustration of our Father and how good He is. And He uses us as an example. In verse 9, Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? Of course, there are some earthly fathers that stumble and fall and are not the type of fathers that they are called to be. But most fathers, Jesus is using the illustration of the good earthly father that if his children ask him for something, he desires to give it. I know like many of you, there are unknown things and sacrifices and things that we do as parents for our children. They'll never understand the depth of our love or the sacrifices that have been made so that they might have and receive the gifts that we desire to give them, the blessing that we try and do. And Jesus says, if that's how we operate, verse 11, if you then, who are evil, when Jesus calls us evil, what he's saying is we are sinful, that we're broken. 
If you then, who are evil, who are sinful, who are broken, know how to good, give good gifts, if you know how to do that, how much more does our Father in Heaven know? How much more will your Father who is in Heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Jesus uses this comparison. Earthly fathers and mothers, you do these things for your children. You make these sacrifices. You give of your life to them. And if you do that as a sinful, broken human being, how much more does the God of the universe, who, by the way, sent His Son. Jesus knew He was going to the cross when He spoke these words. Sent His Son to lay down His life for us. To atone for our sins. That's the type of love that our Heavenly Father has for us. If He loves us that much, how could He ever hold back what Jesus describes here as the good things? See, we dream way too small. We don't want the good things. We just want all the things. And Jesus is saying, your Father in Heaven knows exactly what you need. If we knew all that God knew, we would ask perfectly what God wants to give us. But we don't. We're finite. He is infinite. But if it was possible for us to know all that God knows, we would ask for exactly what God is doing. And if we knew that, if we could see as God sees, and Jesus is calling us to be able to just to lift our eyes a little bit, to pull back the veil or the curtain that's blocking your vision. Look at what I am doing in the world. Pursue my kingdom, my righteousness. And only Jesus can do that for us. And that is why we need His help. And that's why Jesus says, ask, seek, knock, pursue me. Ask your Father for these things. Stop asking Him for the small things. Start asking Him for the big things. Let us be a people, a church, that is consistently praying and asking and pleading with God, knocking down the door of heaven for God to move in our family, in our community, in our nation, in our time. That's what we're to do. That's what we're called to do. The only way we're going to not be a people who condemn. The only way we're going to be a people who forgive. The only way we're going to be a people who live with righteousness and holiness that reflect the kindness and the mercy of Christ, that reflect the goodness of Christ, is if Jesus is at work in us. And He's saying, I know how hard it's going to be for you to do that. But if you'll ask, if you'll seek Me, if you'll knock, your Father in Heaven will hear that prayer and will answer we ask as we pray. Seek God in His Word. Knock. Intentionally and consistently and constantly pursue the things of God. His kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Imagine if we uniformly, with power, with boldness, with deep desire in our hearts in the same way that so many of us might pray for our children. We're seeking and asking God the Father to bring the kingdom to bear here on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus has promised us that he will come to our aid and he will help. That heavy burden that can only be lifted by him, he will do it. So let's go to God. Let's be a people of prayer. Constantly asking seeking and knocking. Lord Jesus, I thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the conviction that it puts upon my own heart. You reveal how often our desires are way too small. As the great saint once said, we are far too easily pleased. Help us to be a people who seek after you. Who live with just, just the constant burden.
pleading for you to, to do what only you can do. And none of that revolves around things of this world. So with our hearts unified this morning, Jesus, we ask for you to help us, make us more like yourself. Help us to know you through your word. And those things that we don't yet know how you're going to answer, what you're going to do, how you're going to break through, we trust that we have a Father in heaven who loves us. That love was proven when he sent you, Jesus, to lay down your life for us. So we rest in that love. We rest in the knowledge of what you have done on our behalf. And trust that if, if our eternity is secure, then we can wait. We can hold on. We can trust you. Thank you, Jesus. We pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen. Let's stand, let's sing together this morning. And as we do that, let's, let's think on that. that uh, <laughs> when was the last time we, we feared that our faith would, might fail, that, that we had pushed into that realm where... the only way that we were going to get out of it was God was going to guide us through it. That we had gone to that neighbor that maybe is struggling. That you stepped into a messy place and let God work through that rather than just living safely. I I know I'm, I'm speaking to myself right now. That we would as Ryan was saying, that we would not sit in the mud pies, but that we would see that God is calling us into something bigger, something grander than just our earthly ones, but that he's asking us to join a spiritual fight for the souls of those that don't know him. So maybe that'd be our prayer this morning as we see. When I feel my faith Christ will Tempter would prevail. He was holding me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often.
this has been satisfied. We will hold this our great hope. Praise to Him in it. Um, as we dismiss this morning, I want to uh, just share a couple uh, of announcements with you. First, if you are here, uh, going to be sticking around for our City Church 201 class. That is uh, our class. Uh, if you desire to join with us in formal uh, membership, covenant partnership here at City Church, that's uh, the class that we offer for that. And that's going to follow immediately after this service. And so if you're here for that, uh, if you'd like to stick around and you just decide the Holy Spirit just sort of impressed upon you, hey, I should stay for lunch today, you're welcome to do that. Um, just stay in this room. So we're going to meet here first for that. Um, and then uh, we'll make our way for lunch in, in a moment once everyone is dismissed. Second, um, on this uh, Tuesday, May the 4th, we have... Our baby boomer uh, community group is meeting. And so um, if you don't know what a baby boomer is, then it's not for you. And so that's just uh, all you need to know about that. But if you, if you are or you do know what that is, and then we invite you, I uh, want you to be around uh, for that um, on Tuesday evening. They're going to meet here at the church at 630. Um, and uh, just would love to see everyone uh, jump in and participate in that group if, uh, if that fits your demographic. And so be here Tuesday. Um, they're the first Tuesday of every month they, they meet for fellowship and study of the Word. And then uh, Saturday, ladies, uh, we have your ladies' sweet tea. And uh, so just want to invite all of the ladies. Uh, I've never been to that event before um, because I'm not a lady. Um, and uh, But... The, my wife tells me uh, that it's uh, just an amazing time, a very special time every year. Uh, she hasn't missed it since we started doing these. And so, uh, ladies, I want to invite you to be back here on Saturday uh, at 11 a.m. Um, and uh, it's a great place. If I, I look around the room, I see so many that you, you might not know one another, and I don't know you as well. You might not know some other ladies. This is a great place to gather together. You'll get to hear some testimonies of just God's faithfulness um, from a couple of your sisters and just be encouraged in the word. And so, um, be there. Uh, if you have any questions, Leanne Richardson, our women's minister, is going to join me right up front here um, and stick it around for a little bit after uh, when we dismiss here and just momentarily. Um, and you can come talk with her if you need more details about that. Um, I'll also be down front, as I said, I would love a chance to just pray with you, encourage you if I haven't had a chance to meet you, to meet you personally and uh, say hello to you. Um, so with that, God bless you. Thank you so much. Love you guys. Have a great week.